finished our study of Timothy and first and second Timothy and Titus this week. Uh, sorry it got interrupted. My stenographer was under the weather for a number of weeks and we did finish. Um, hopefully I'll be able to get out and find another study. Uh, look for a lesson Wednesday night. I'll try to come up with a lesson even though we don't have a book right now. Um, our scripture lesson this morning I'm going to read two or three other scriptures, but the main lesson is comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in the 17th verse, talking about various things, and then going on to behavior with the Lord's Supper uh, in verses 23 through the end of the chapter. So seven. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 17. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What do you not have houses in which to eat and drink, or do you despise the church of God and the shame of those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Is this I will, in this I will not praise you. And then the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you eat and drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are sick and weak, and a number sleep. But we have judged ourselves rightly, and we would not have been judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. For if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your scripture. Thank you for the writings of the Apostle Paul and for how he guides us and gives us lessons to go by. We pray, Lord, that as we look at this scripture and others this morning, you would bless our time together and help us, give us understanding from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. May think to yourself, why is he talking about communion? We had communion last week, and uh, why again today? Well, I had reasoning, and the, the time Nancy asked me for a title, and I finally came up with one, No Fences, No Tokens. And maybe that'll become clear before the end of the message. Um, the middle of the week, something came out, that caused me to think and stir about the scripture and about the article. There was an article that came from General Conference uh, 
the director of church health and who's been involved in publications and all for a number of years, Justin Nash, wrote an article, Four Reasons the Church Should Not Celebrate Virtual Communion. And I guess maybe originally it got my hair up on my back thinking that we've been doing that and I sort of thought it was a good idea. And he's telling me we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, I will say that he was very gracious in saying churches and pastors and church boards who decide to do this are very well intentioned and their reasons for doing it are all positive and they mean well. Nevertheless, he came up with four reasons that he didn't think it was a good idea. And since we had just had communion, and since the next communion Sunday is Easter Sunday, and we're going to be thinking about the resurrection, I'm sure, on um, that week, I decided that I wanted to address this this week. Now, to be honest with you, my first reaction to the reading of the article was, he's all wet. I, I didn't agree at all, and then I went back and read it a second and third time. I read the scripture that we have for a scripture lesson, and although I understood his reasoning and a lot of what he said made sense, it didn't ring true to me as reasons that we should give up on having virtual communion. We're trying to accommodate as many of our folks as possible, those who don't feel safe or comfortable in getting out for services, we want to be in their homes and try to minister to them as well. Let me give you the four reasons that I encourage you to go on the ACGC website or Facebook page and read this article and don't just take my word for it, read it for yourself. And there's a lot of good things in the article. I just didn't agree with his conclusion. But Justin says, the Lord's Supper is for the assembled church. It's for us who meet as the body. It's not necessarily for people at home. But I, I would thought to myself, and as I started thinking more and more, what have we done for years and years through taking communion to nursing homes or shut-ins? It's communion not for those folks who are unable to get out for church services, and now it's sort of the same deal. People, because of the pandemic, don't feel comfortable in coming out. There's been nothing like the pandemic in any of our lifetimes. And yet people still are staying home and feel uncomfortable. So I say to that, we need to make communion available to those folks. It's, um, he makes the point, if you look in verses 17, 18, 20, 33, and 34 of our scripture lesson, that Paul uses the term, come together. So it is about coming together, but his come togethers in this passage, actually Paul is saying they come together and they're up to no good. They fight, there's factions involved in the church. When they get there, they, they don't know, or they don't treat it like communion, they treat it like a church supper, like who's first in line, and I can't wait to get my share of all the goodies that have been made. Don't you miss church suppers? We haven't had one in well over a year now, and I'm, I'm ready to have one. I, mean, I can find food one place or another, but I'm ready for a church supper. But these people, their conduct, even though they were coming together, wasn't for the good, and evidently wasn't really about taking the Lord's Supper. It was about who could eat first and who could fill their stomachs. And Paul says to them, don't you have your own houses to eat and drink in? So, yes, communion is for the assembled church, but it is also for the people that for one reason or another can't make it out or don't feel comfortable in being out. The Lord's Supper is a sign of unity. Yeah, I've given that too. 
when we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, it is a sign of our unity and our coming together and having being a like-minded church. But nonetheless, does that make people that are uncomfortable being here on a Sunday morning still? Does that make them any part or any less part of the body of Christ? Let me read two other scriptures about unity and about what coming together in church means. The first is in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Unity of the Spirit, this is a chapter, the whole chapter talks about the body of Christ. But Paul starts out in Ephesians 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling in which you have been called, with all your mentally and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were all called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. And Paul could have added, there's one communion service, and we host them once a month. Other places do it far less often. Some churches uh, do it every week. I found out last night, I, I talked to my roommate, who was a Presbyterian minister for our, over 40 years, and I was surprised to find that one branch of the Presbyterian church celebrates communion every week, like the Church of Christ, and that was just a, a new fact to me. But it's important that we come together and we have unity. And in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews also talks about unity and coming together. Hebrews 10, 22 through 25. Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with a pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So I'll give Justin the first two points that it's important that the assembled church celebrate communion together, but it doesn't mean that other people shouldn't be allowed to take part. It is a sign of our unity, and don't you feel close, not only close to the Lord, but close to each other when we celebrate communion together? I think it's a wonderful thing, but I want to be able to include people that can't be here on a communion Sunday. The third point, and I found this interesting. Virtual Lord suppers, sharing the meal with people over the internet, online, virtual suppers make it impossible to fence off the table. So no fences. What is, I know what fencing off, keeping your cows or your chickens within a fence or whatever <laughs> as a rancher or a farmer, but what does fencing off the table mean? I confess to you, Tracy's shaking her head, I think she's heard of this before, but I had never heard that particular terminology. Now I knew that as a pastor and in communion services, I've been challenged as Paul challenges the people in our scripture lesson, uh, beginning in verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Now, we caution people, I have before, maybe I don't do it before every communion Sunday, 
but I caution people to think about their relationship with the Lord and before you partake of the body and blood of Christ, the cup and the, the uh, cup and the bread, think about your relationship and get right with the Lord before you partake. But this idea of fencing off, uh, I found that came in background from the Scottish Presbyterian Church. It was something that was done many years ago. And so I read a couple of articles about it. One was talking about tokens and one about fences. And then I decided on the spur of the moment to call my roommate in Indiana who had been a Presbyterian minister for 40 years. And I asked him, have you ever heard of the concept of fencing off? And I heard the biggest laugh on the other end of the phone. And he evidently knew what I was talking about right away. And he's retired now. And uh, I asked him about it. He said, oh yes, that comes from the PCA Church, Presbyterian Church of America, and from the Scottish Presbyterian roots of that church. And then he proceeded to tell me some interesting stories. He has an elder in his church who, like some of our people, don't feel comfortable in coming back out to church, but he's not allowed to take communion now by himself because the church is holding services, but yet he doesn't feel comfortable in coming out. Their original ruling was that everybody could do virtual services. But now the Presbyterian Synod says, because your church is holding services again, anybody that wants to take communion should come to church. He also told me about the concept of tokens. And he told me if I come see him, he'll show me his token. It was given to him by a Scottish Presbyterian church. And the idea of tokens is this. Now imagine this. Now that I'm Penny, if Penny had to take roll every week and keep track of how many Sundays a year you made it to church, and if you didn't make your quota, you didn't get a token to be able to take communion. Or if now that took record of how much you gave and how often you gave to the church, a tithing record, it said, no, you didn't give enough, you can't get a token, and you can't take communion. And I was rather amused by all of this. But some churches in the Presbyterian faith actually do this. Now, Justin used this terminology, fencing off the table, but I don't know of any Advent Christian church that I've ever been involved in or know of that actually physically fences off the table. They may warn people that they need to take care of their relationship with the Lord before they take communion, but as far as literally saying, no, you can't take communion because you don't meet our standards, to me, that's not what communion's all about. So I'm not worried about fencing off the table. The fourth point that Justin made in the article is that virtual suppers, taking communion online, tends to individualize our faith. It, it makes it between just between you and the Lord, where it should be the Lord and his body coming together. And I actually understood the reasoning behind that point maybe more than the others. Communion is an individual thing between you and the Lord, your relationship, but as much as possible, as much as possible, it should be done corporately. There's more to it when we come together and we celebrate around the table of the Lord together. Good point. I don't, still don't think it's a reason to stop sharing with our friends and loved ones virtually. So, what did we get from all of this? What did I get from it? What is the important? Why is it important that we offer our service and especially our communion to those on the website and on our Facebook page during the pandemic? Justin talked about unity. 
I think the fact that we have our services on air, and especially our communion service, promotes unity in our church. It shows that we haven't forgotten those who can't come out or who are some way hesitant to come out still because of the pandemic. It's always, but especially during the Lenten season, to recognize that communion is about us in our relationship with the Lord. It's His body, His blood of the new covenant that we celebrate together. And I don't want to be the person that says, no, if you can't make it to church, I'm got, not going to be not going to allow you to share that with us. I think it's important that we share these things with our other people. Now, conclusion: I don't know if there's anything wrong. You read the article, you judge for yourself, you read the scriptures. I don't know if there's anything wrong with us doing virtual communion. My personal opinion is I think not. I think we need to continue to do it. But certainly, the good in offering virtual communion and offering our services, not only to our members and friends, but you don't know who may watch this and be blessed, not by my speaking, but blessed by the Word of God and the fact that we celebrate around the table. We don't know who's going to see that and who might be blessed. So certainly, I think the good in offering virtual communion certainly outweighs anything that could possibly be wrong with it. And that's what I gathered from reading this article and these scriptures. May God bless the reading of this word. Amen.